Welcome to the NAHA webinar brought to you by the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy. To learn more about NAHA, please visit www.naha.org. Tonight's presentation topic is Aromatherapy in the Treatment of Atopic Dermatitis and Other Inflammatory Skin Conditions. This educational webinar is being presented by Jade Schutz. Jade Schutz holds a diploma in holistic aromatherapy, holistic massage, and reflexology. She has completed the advanced studies in both aromatherapy and herbal medicine. Jade is the current past president of NAHA. She has been practicing and studying forms of natural healing for over two decades and one is one of the first of the vanguard of professionals who helped introduce aromatherapy to the United States. She has been an aromatherapy educator for over 25 years and has played an active role in the setting of standards for aromatherapy education in North America. She has designed and taught aromatherapy courses for massage and bodywork therapists, estheticians, social workers, nurses, and other healthcare providers, and has taught at well-known colleges, including Barrister University and Duke University. Jake Jade is currently completing her Master's of Science in Therapeutic Herbalism at the Mayland University of Integrative Health. She is the Director of Education for the East-West School of Aromatic Studies. And to learn more about Jade, please visit her website at www.aromaticstudies.com. I'd like to take a moment and welcome Jade for being here tonight and presenting on this very important topic. Thank you, Kelly. All right, everyone, we have a lot to cover this evening. Um, as, as Kelly said, I'm currently in graduate school and this semester I'm taking a pathophysiology class and I really have been enjoying um, the case studies that we've been able to work on along with just the deepening of my own uh, knowledge of chronic inflammatory disorders from you know from the skin to digestive system to the respiratory system and I hope that this at least sheds some light on some of the benefits aromatherapy can have in treating um, conditions such as atopic dermatitis and other inflammatory skin conditions. So I wanted to first obviously thank NAHA for providing these educational webinars and what used to be uh, our teleseminar, teleseminars. So thank you everyone at NAHA. And then I just wanted to kind of touch base on our role as aromatherapist because sometimes I, I think I perceive um, that uh, aromatherapy is often seen as like a, a curative substance, like it's going to cure conditions. And sometimes it can, say, in um, using essential oils in the treatment of bacterial uh, respiratory infection. You know, essential oils uh, kill the bacteria, so in a way it provides a cure. But most of the time, essential oils are going to serve as either supportive, like a supportive role to other aspects of our wellness from exercise and diet. Um, and then sometimes, you know, they're just there to support our emotional health and well-being. So, and then sometimes the kind of purpose of my bringing this up is that essential oils play a role in easing symptoms of specific conditions. So it doesn't mean, you know, we use essential oils for eczema and psoriasis and some of the other uh, chronic inflammatory diseases and we cure them so much as we are able to help assist keeping them um, either in remission or reducing the severity or uh, length of, of the exacerbation um, or simply in, in, in earlier stages, potentially even prevent uh, ongoing episodes. So we'll get to all of that. But basically just to acknowledge that it's not always about curing an illness. Sometimes it's about how do we um, either affect emotional well-being or reduce symptoms. So just a quick overview of healthy 
inputs, like these are different aspects of what makes our or goes into the health of our skin. So from the amount of sleep we get to exercise, emotional well-being, physical health, or our own vitality or ojas, how we take care of ourselves, relaxation, genetics certainly plays a role, epigenetics plays a role. Um, diet and nutrition. So these are all inputs that go into the health of the skin. And I think as aromatherapists, this is where we want to put our our emphasis is on you know where we can add to these healthy inputs um, to maintain the health of the skin. With chronic inflammatory diseases, of course, we're going to be thinking about how we can treat them effectively. So the core, uh, the most common being eczema, but the the other chronic inflammatory skin diseases include psoriasis, hives, which is also known as uh, urticaria, and then heat rash, miliaria. So these are the ones we're going, we're going to be uh, really focusing on atopic dermatitis, and each one involves slightly different mechanisms in the inflammatory uh, process. With eczema, it's IgE-driven. Um, with psoriasis, it's a, just an inflammatory disorder of hyperkeratinization. And then hives, it's more um, histamine reaction. And then same with heat rash, it's a histamine and just general uh, inflammation process. We do want to distinguish between acute and chronic inflammation. With acute inflammation, as aromatherapists, we're typically not treating it. it. Acute inflammation is a really important part of the healing process with acute, say, damage or injury to the tissue. So it's our first line of defense, and the main goal of that inflammatory process is to localize and remove injurious or infectious agents. Um, and so that's where we get, with the acute inflammation, we get the redness, the swelling, the warmth, and the pain. And it's sudden. It's sudden and it's short-lived. It's, it's acute inflammation doesn't go on for months and months. If it goes on for months and months, it's chronic inflammation. And it develops either because the, the initial kind of uh, stimuli, stimuli for the inflammatory response was not properly removed, um, or some type of chronic irritation exists, be it smoking or other environmental pollutants, or there's some type of abnormal immune response happening. With um, the mediators of chronic inflammation do change. There's obviously less um, swelling and pain associated in chronic inflammation. Um, so less swelling and exudate, sorry, not pain, exudate, with more uh, lymphocytes, macrophages, and fibroblasts than in acute. And those are such showing this kind of ongoing relationship in chronic inflammation between the destruction and the healing of inju injured tissue, creating this kind of chronic inflammatory condition. All right, so what is atopic dermatitis? Atopic dermatitis is a chronic inflammatory skin disease characterized by pruritus, which is uh, itchiness, eczema, which is like the lesions, the physical uh, appearance of the inflammatory like, lesions, and then the cutaneous hyperreactivity or sensitivity to environmental triggers, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. Atopic dermatitis can vary from being very mild to moderate, and then it, there's very severe forms. Atopy, so when we say atopic dermatitis, atopy refers to the genetic tendency to develop al allergic diseases, such as allergic rhinitis, asthma, and atopic dermatitis. So there's usually, a, there, or there can be a genetic component to atopic dermatitis. And it's typically associated with heightened immune responses to common allergens, especially inhaled allergens and food allergens. This is one thing as I was doing research was the most emphasized is the um, environmental allergens must be removed. I mean, it's a, just a really important part of the treatment. You know, they, they need to be discovered and then as much as possible removed or reduced. So just some um, statistics on atopic dermatitis. 
the prevalence, it's, it occurs 10 to 20 percent in children. So the largest group of individuals suffering from atopic dermatitis are actually children under the age of five. Um, and then within that group, uh, 60 percent of those children are under the age of two. And then it, it occurs approximately one to three percent in adults. 50% of children who experience early, basically, which is the most common, uh, either infant or uh, child uh, atopic dermatitis, they will experience complete clearance by the age of 13. And then 50% will experience some type of recurrence um, in adolescence as well as adulthood. So, and they'll go through these periods of remission and then exacerbation. So this is where, you know, some of that, that exacerbation can come from some of the factors that trigger, which we'll talk about, uh, atopic dermatitis. Some of this group, so the 50% that uh, experience recurrence as adolescents and adults, uh, will also go on to do what's called the atopic march, and we'll, we'll cover that in just a minute. So adult onset occurs um, as well, and it, it occurs without prior history of atopic dermatitis as a child. Then family history, we've, we've mentioned a moment ago, may include one or more of the following. So this is someone in the individual's family um, may have had one of these allergies, eczema, allergic rhinitis, um, or some other type of, of allergy-based disorder. Areas involved as well as the appearance of e eczema will change based upon age. And this we have here, patterns for atopic e eczema. So with an infant, we usually get these facial lesions and then some patchy um, sections on other parts of the body. A lot of times it will be near the fold or um, same with the older child, we get more of the extremities and the feet and the hands and then patches in the folds. And then adults, we can get hand and foot uh, uh, dermatitis and then these patches. And it, again, it can range from very mild to severe. The appearance in infants, the um, pruritic, the itchy lesions will be moist, red, and vesicular. So there'll be lesions that will uh, have some type of fluid within it, and then it will be covered with crust. With teenager and adult, it's a dry scaling with lichen lichenification, which is a thickening of the skin. It produces these kind of leather, leathery-like patches. It may be moist and red, particularly in the skin folds, and then puritis is common, so there will be itching. I mean, itch, itchiness is like the hallmark of acute dermatitis or atopic dermatitis. This is a picture of a more severe dermatitis, so you can see they have scratched quite a bit as well. It's from Wikipedia. And this is what I referred to earlier as the atopic march. So some individuals who experience a, uh, atop, atopic dermatitis will go on to develop allergic, uh, allergic asthma or, and or allergic rhinitis, which is hay fever. So and you can see just from this chart, you know, it will start with the eczema. I mean, it's almost like they're, they're co-occurring. Uh, with food allergy, asthma, and then a little later on, rhinitis, hay fever. So in an article I was reading, they were saying that um, this early eczema food allergy awareness can possibly be used to prevent the respiratory allergy from occurring. I'm not sure how to do that, but I thought it was interesting. All right, and then features. So puritis is it, like the itchiness. That's actually the one of the first things to happen. So we itch, and then we break. You know, rash appears. We have experiences of exacerbations with periods of uh, remission, 
the dryness. This is a, actually a core, like, kind of signature that something's happened with the skin's barrier function, dryness. And if it can be extreme, like where it looks like cirrhosis. And then it's an IgE dominant uh, inflammatory disorder. It's, there's at least 50% are IgE dominant. And then there's some variables as well that happens. I wanted to put this slide in. This isn't in the PDF, but I, I was kind of just flipping through very quickly before this webinar. <laughs> it's been so excessive with the information, so hopefully it's not too much. But this is actually from um, Ben Zula and uh, Buck's book. Because it's a disorder that most commonly affects those under the age of two, um, I just thought it would be important to recognize and throw out there that if you have newborns or young children, to be really simple in their um, cleansing uh, of uh, just how we cleanse infants. So it's to wash with water only, to bathe for less than five minutes, dry completely with cotton or linen towel, be mindful of strong detergents, avoid synthetic fragrances. You can do like an oat bath if this like just put a bit of oatmeal in uh, like a muslin bag and put let that float in the water if the skin is irritated. Or add a teaspoon of lavender or German hydrosol if the skin is irritated. It's actually really effective to do that with my son. But I just remember with my own son, it's it's really, um, you just want to be so simple in those those first couple of months in particular. So, and then of course, if, if the baby does uh, have uh, signs of atopic dermatitis, to be mindful in kind of searching different potential allergens and removing them from their environment. We're not going to get into like what's really pathophysiology with all these interleukins and these uh, uh, immunoglobulins and <laughs> whatnot, but this is basically what's going on. I mean, there's there's all these, so these are immunoglobulins and uh, or interleukin, interleukins, immunoglobulins, I'm not sure the CCCL, I'll find out. Um, histamine you'll recognize, but basically all of these things are happening in the inflammatory process of atopic dermatitis. Contributing factors um, and things that trigger atopic dermatitis. So we have environmental factors, and the environmental factors we're going to cover in a moment, so they can be airborne, um, they can be, um, you know, the physical um, things within the environment, whether it's cat, de uh, animal dander. There's a strong component of genetics, which we've already mentioned a couple of times, about uh, family history. Stress can be a contributing factor and a trigger. So if someone already has atopic dermatitis, um, stress can, can trigger an exacerbation. The microbiome, I, I put this on there, I was not, I did not have time to really read a lot about the microbiome and the skin, although I do have a great article. Um, but it's becoming increasingly important, and of course the skin has its own microbiome. In atopic dermatitis, there is an over-proliferation of Staphylococcus aureus. So, which is normally found in the skin, but it, it makes the skin in atopic dermatitis more prone to infection. So there's something there about the, the microbiome. Um, and the limited information we have on essential oils is that they actually do not injure commensal organisms but they do destroy, of course, in different ways, pathogenic organisms. So there's, there's something there. I think there's, there's still some work to do on, on that. And, and just to quickly go back to stress, um, the skin also has its own HPA axis. So it's, it's another place where, where we respond to the level of stress and it's reflected in our skin. So both of those, I think, are really important and places where essential oils can be beneficial. The defective skin barrier is, it has to do with this filigrin um, 
component, which is we'll talk about in a moment. And then, of course, like I just said about the microbiome, um, part of atopic dermatitis is the overproliferation, most commonly of Staphylococcus aureus. And atopic dermatitis makes the skin not only overproliferate, proliferate um, pathogenic bacteria, but also um, what was I going to say? Increase the likelihood of an infection occurring. The most common triggers are arrow allergens, um, house dust mites, pollen, food allergies, changes in physical environment, so uh, including the level of uh, pollution and humidity, microbial infection, stress, other irritants. All of these triggers lead to itching, crazy, crazy itching. So it becomes this kind of cycle of itch creates scratch, creates um, well skin barrier function. Um, is already, or dysfunction rather, is already occurring. There's the inflammatory response, which really is kind of in reaction to the scratching. Um, immune dysfunction continues, the itch, scratch, I mean, we just keep going in this, not quite, it's not quite like one, two, three, four, it's, it's all happening a little bit concurrently. Uh, but the itch cycle itself, one thing I was reading which I thought was really interesting in my research was that a, 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 in moderate to severe atopic eczema or dermatitis, the itch can uh, wake people up. So there's a loss of sleep and of course the loss of sleep affects so many things in our body. It's what we've learned, you know, from how we um, metabolize, the, you know, it can create meta uh, sluggish metabolism. Um, how we feel, our energy level, and of course our sensitivity to stress and our feelings of depression. So sleep becomes uh, an important issue we could address as well as a aromatherapist. So some of the um, key aspects pointed towards the what the cause or what's happening with atopic dermatitis is there's skin barrier dysfunction, there's immune dysfunction, and of course there's inflammation. All right, so we're going to look a little bit at the structure of the skin, and I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly because I want to get to the different ideas of how we can use essential oils. If you don't know, just a quick review, there's the upper layer of the skin is called the epidermis. Um, the layer below the epidermis is the dermis, and then there's a layer of fat, which is often called sub the subcutaneous layer. The layer that we're most concerned about is the top layer of the epidermis, and it's called the stratum corneum, and it makes up what is called the skin barrier. And the skin barrier is one of the most important things that the skin does because it helps with so many other um, aspects of our health and wellness. So it's the, basically because it's the first line of defense. It's our first kind of keeping the, you know, negative or pathogenic material you know, outside of our body and, and prohibiting them from entering our body. Um, and not necessarily just pathogens, but even toxins. All right, so the skin barrier functions, it has epidermal permeability barrier, so it prevents movement in and out, specifically of water. A lot of this is about holding on to water. It's a UV barrier, a mechanical barrier, so you know, like obviously, like if it's hit or trauma, so there's a barrier, an antimicrobial barrier, and an antioxidant barrier. The raison d'etre, which is like, you know, the, the most important role of the stratum corneum is its impermeability. So except for small amounts of water loss to hydrate the outer layers, like um, by releasing water into the sebum to create what's commonly called like the acid mantle of the skin, um, the stratum corneum barriers basically maintains flexibility and provides enough water to allow enzymes to facilitate stratum corneum maturation because as they mature, they create what's called natural moisturizing factor, which is really important in what we call trans in preventing rather trans epidermal water loss. So, 
the, the skin barrier is very important and there's a lot of things happening to keep it intact and healthy. The one thing to understand about the, the stratum corneum is that it, it's designed as basically what we call brick and mortar design. So it has like these um, cells with the uh, corneocytes which make up the bricks. I'm pointing with my fingers thinking you can see that. So the, these are the bricks. And the lipid is the, the, or the matrix is this lipid mortar. And the skin has a whole bunch of different types of lipids in it. Um, if we get a chance, I'll kind of go over a few. Uh, let's see if I have those here. Yeah, all right, so I'll just keep going. So it's this brick and mortar design. Let's see. Let me just. All right. The principal lipids found in the stratum corneum include ceramides, uh, cholesterol, fatty acid, and fatty acids. And it's this mortar mortar of lipids that prevents water loss through the stratum corneum. It's like our skin has to have enough water or moisture to be healthy and how we lose water is either by A, not taking it internally or and or B, by um, uh, like, like using harsh detergents on our skin or uh, uh, other like even synthetic fragrances I believe ha cause some damage to the skin. So, so it's basically just using uh, products that we use in aromatherapy that complement the, the matrix, both the fatty acid um, matrix as well as the water. So we can use like creams and lotions and we'll get to that actually. So here's the components I just mentioned, ceramides, cholesterol, fatty acids, other components. We're not going to get too much into why any of these are important right now other than that they play an important role in the barrier function. So what we can see here is in the normal barrier function, we have this really nice, healthy kind of stratum corneum. It has this natural moisturizing factor. Let me actually just go over. So what we call the natural moisturizing factor, um, it's basically a collection of water-soluble compounds such as free amino acids, urea, lactic acid, sugars, and peptides that are only found in this layer, the stratum corneum. And they're responsible for keeping the skin moist and pliable by attracting and holding water. So again, water, water, this is where we have like really great hydrosols to use. The lipids serve to prevent water loss from occurring in the natural um, moisturizing factor. When the skin loses too much water, there are signs of what we call xerosis, which is abnormal dryness of the skin. And so, in, in, the, in eczema or atopic dermatitis, that's what's happening. We're getting this kind of breaking up of um, the uh, stratum corneum cells. The NMF is, is reduced, and then you're getting these cracks in between the cells so that the lipid matrix is being distorted as well. And an important one fatty acid that will be really important to use in the treatment of atomic, atopic dermatitis is uh, it's a, uh, vegetable oils that are rich in linoleic acid, which would be like borage seed, and I believe rosehip as well. I do want to put this in because I came across this really interesting article about Rose Absolute, um, and it had to do with the, one of the genetic defects um, considered to be responsible uh, for uh, the creation of atopic dermatitis is called filigreen, filigrin. And it's essential for the regulation of epidermal homeostasis, and it aggreg aggregates the carotene cytoskeleton to facilitate the flattening of the keratinocytes. So basically what that's saying is that the filigreen is very important in what we call keratinized or keratinite, keratino, 
keratinocyte differentiation. And as they flatten, it's through that process that creates those lipids that are so important in the um, natural moisturizing factor and to prevent trans-epidermal water loss. So when, they're de when it's decreased, um, it causes a, a decreased a reduction in hydration and an increased epidermal water, so the water loss, which means the skin's losing water. And this is happening with atopic dermatitis. And so there's been research, there's just one paper that I found um, that rose absolute, and the species was not specified in the paper, enhanced keratinite, keratinocyte differentiation. Again, it, that helps to create those lipids in the um, kind of uh, brick and mortar design of the stratum corneum. It increases levels of filigrin, which so again, it helps trigger that keratinization process. And it accelerated the recovery of a disturbed fun uh, barrier function. Now, I do need to add that this, this test was done using mice, but in aromatherapy, we still refer to some animal studies to get our um, understanding of how an essential oil might be acting. So I don't agree with it, but it's research. Okay, and then so with aromatherapy for atopic dermatitis, there's several ways we want to consider how we approach any individual client. So we want to be mindful of skin hydration and barrier repair. So we'll talk about that in a moment with different essential oils, uh, vegetable oils, and uh, herbal products. Topical anti-inflammatory, so we'll talk about anti-inflammatory. Uh, control or elimination of infection, that's going to be a secondary to this topic. I'm not, I'm not going to go too much into actually treating infections that might occur um, from scratching the skin and um, through that reduced immune function, but it will be listed as a top uh, a therapeutic action to consider. And then elimination of exacerbating factors. It's as much up to us as, uh, as aromatherapists to help clients, friends, families to find uh, potential sources for what might be causing or contributing to atopic dermatitis. Therapeutic actions we are looking at when we want to like, kind of think about which essential oils or hydrosols, et cetera, we would want to use. So we're certainly looking for antioxidant. Uh, I'm getting a sense we can't really use too many antioxidants in today's world, um, both internally and externally. Anti-inflammatory, and you know, this also sometimes referred to as antiphlogistic, antihistamine, antipyritic. So anti being against, you know, it's like against oxidation, against inflammation, against histamine against itching, so it's to stop, to stop those from occurring. Or, uh, and then emollients, these are things that soften and soothe the skin. Essential oils aren't really emollient at all, so we need to focus on vegetable oils, herbal oils, specialty oils, creams, and lotions to provide the skin with uh, emollient. So given that during atopic dermatitis there's a lot of dryness, that can trigger, you know, a, a atopic dermatitis. We want to be using quite a lot of emollients um, when we can. Usually, that's that tends to be when it's in a subacute um, or in in a remission state versus if it's in an acute phase um, or exacerbation. We'd want to focus on what's next, which are your cooling substances such as gels, um, specifically aloe vera gel-based uh, products. Secondary, some can be primary. There has been some research on uh, the effects that both the potential of emotional conditions triggering a skin condition and also on the reverse side of that, a skin condition that can cause people to have various emotions attached to it, be it depression, anxiety, 
stress, etc. So using essential oils as nervines or anxiolytics to help relieve anxiety can be really uh, helpful. It's an immune um, disorder as well, so there could be some implication for immune modulatory essential oils, and I think that would be a really good externally. And then antibacterial, antiviral activity. So if an infection did occur, we could look at essential oils um, that are antibacterial, antiviral, and specific to the skin. And then for aromatics, just simply to help people feel better and uplift their mood and um, alter perception um, of themselves or um, the appearance of their skin. So just looking at antioxidant, I'm going to kind of go through this um, quickly. I, I wanted to keep this in um, this slide presentation because they're so important. Um, and of course, in a chronic inflammatory um, response, we can have the creation of quite a lot of ROS, which is um, reactive oxygen species, which are created like when the, in the body, like in response to stress or the inflammatory uh, response produces reactive oxygen species. And normally, you know, we're equally good at, you know, picking up and scavenging those free radicals. But sometimes that imbalance between free radical production and removal um, occurs, and so we have what's called oxidative stress, and oxidative stress contributes to inflammation, such as inflammatory skin diseases, aging, and other degenerative diseases. So we have um, the antioxidant activity of essential oils is perhaps one of the most important biological activities attributed to essential oils, and from Jennifer Peace Rind, she says it is at the the root of many other properties, including their anti-inflammatory and pain-relieving action. So, and then I made a note as well as for their anti-carcinogenic and anti-aging potential. So, with antioxidants, because a lot of essential oils that have antioxidant activity, um, these are the different areas we can um, be effective at anti-aging, protecting the skin from oxidative damage or stress. Again, we recall that, that um, HPA access um, support anti-inflammatory activity of essential oils. Support, this is where atopic dermatitis should stand out. Supports the keratinocyte differentiation, which in turn supports skin barrier function. So that was the same thing with the filigrin. Um, was to support that differentiation, which is what's responsible for the production of lipids in the skin, which helps prevent moisture loss. All right, antioxidants also help in uh, wound healing. So I'm not going to go through each of these individual ones. If you didn't get the PDF, you will be getting the PDF. So, and the, uh, Kelly's actually included it here as well. Um, so you can have this list of antioxidant essential oils. These are antioxidant vegetable oils um, that you can use in your formulations for atopic dermatitis. And the different applications, um, for the most part, when we're using emollients, we can use them in creams, lotions, we can make specific body oils. I feel like um, as children, if, we're, if our skin has just a tendency towards dryness, I mean, that child could be more in Ayurveda, it would be more vata. I know my son's skin tends to be more dry. It could be important to use these um, skin oils uh, either before or after they bathe. Depends on what kind of bath you have. Um, we have a cloth with tub. I'd be paranoid. My son would like stumble and fall if I put oil in there before, so I put it on afterwards. And the main <laughs> rule would be to um, prevent the skin from drying out, because taking baths can actually, unfortunately, be rather dehydrating to the skin. So either before or after bathing or showering is a good idea to use skin oils. And then the salves are really great emollients as well. The dilution we'll use is anywhere from 1 to 5 percent of antioxidants. All right, anti-inflammatory. So I'm not going to get too much into this because I see it's already like 9.15. So, um, so, but I'll say just this, I think one of my goals tonight was just to draw our attention to 
how essential oils do anything that they do. So specifically um, with the anti-inflammatory aspect to essential oils, we have these uh, what we call uh, chemical mediators of the inflammatory process in our body. And essential oils can actually increase or decrease the formation of inflammatory mediators. And there's an extensive, I mean, you'd just be shocked at how much research has gone into how, um, not, not necessarily always the whole essential oil, but often different components can affect the uh, chronic inflammatory uh, process. All right, it can suppress activity of specific enzymes, specifically what's called um, uh, COX-2. And COX-2 is just an enzyme that's responsible for inflammation um, and also part of the pain. Um, five locks and uh, phospholipase A. We're not going to get into all of that. I have my whole list of different substances, but we'll We'll review that, I think, in an advanced class. Um, it can also suppress histamine release and cytokine production. So, and, and cytokines, if, if, if I'm sure you're more familiar with histamine, but cytokines are basically important in the uh, cell signaling. They're released by different cells and they affect the behavior of other cells. So they're sending kind of like messengers. So basically, with essential oils in our body, it's a form of molecular communication or chemical, chemical communication. So specifically here we have how um, alpha bisabolol, which is a, a component found in um, German chamomile, Matricaria recutita, that uh, down regulates, basically reduces pro-inflammatory uh, mediator, so, so, and by doing so, reduces the inflammation. So, and, and do remember, this isn't something we want when someone's going through an acute inflammatory response, which is really important. It's an important part of the healing process. But with these chronic inflammatory conditions, which are on the rise, um, this, this, this is where we want to be using these types of substances. And then inhibition of no production, this is an area, quite a number of essential oils can in inhibit what's basically called, it's nitric oxide or NO, N-O. It's a signaling molecule that plays a key role in the pathogenesis of inflammation. So it gives an anti-inflammatory effect under normal physiological conditions, but then it becomes a pro-inflammatory mediator that induces inflammation to overproduce in abnormal situations, such as atopic dermatitis. So many essential oils inhibit this from occurring, inhibit this pro-inflammatory um, state from occurring. And we'll, we'll be going over those essential oils. So these are just uh, other ways that essential oils have molecular communication with cells in our body. So we have inhibits 5 lipoxy the genase, sorry, the tongue tie, um, and this this component actually converts essential fatty acids in, into leukotrienes, which are pro-inflammatory mediators, and then they inhibit the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is tumor necrosis factor A and interleukin 1B and interleukin 6, and those all have specific things that they do in the inflammatory process. And then also essential oils can inhibit the activation of what we call transcrip transcription factors, which is like basically affecting the DNA, RNA of the cell um, via something called NF-KB. So we're not going to get too much into that. Well, that, that's about it. I just wanted to give you a little insight into how essential oils are doing what they're doing. So this is a list of anti-inflammatory essential oils. You'll have all of this on your PDF. So there's quite a lot. And these are just the ones that have strong research supporting them as anti-inflammatories. And that's the case with all of our lists in this PDF. Anti-inflammatory essential oils to consider specifically for children. So for those under the age of two, I might suggest thinking about the hydrosol of these essential oils, and for over two, just low dilutions, like 0.5%.
Hydrosols are super important um, to be using, particularly because, again, this is a most commonly an onset with young children, even infants, so hydrosols can become a really effective tool to have to uh, work with a younger population. So these are good ones to have. Peppermint is a uh, cooling, so that, that, that's actually a really good one for when there's psoriasis versus uh, atopic dermatitis. Um, witch hazel is something I'd use for atopic dermatitis instead. Herbal and vegetable oils to consider, uh, calendula, chickweed, these are all in the anti-inflammatory camp. Uh, plantain, St. John's wort, tamanu, and jojoba is anti-inflammatory. And then with our treatment approaches, and we'll, we'll get to a couple of um, other recommendations as well. So uh, with acute, so there's with dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, we can have an acute exacerbation, a subacute. So this is where it's going down into maybe a, um, a kind of a, a remission, chronic. So during the acute phase, we have a lot of redness and inflammation, those tiny bumps and vesicles, so little bumps with fluids. The best way to treat it is through the use of cool compresses with those hydrocells we were just talking about um, here, German chamomile, lavender, yarrow. Peppermint, I would just indicate for someone who is a little bit older, maybe for infants it might be too much. So, um, so I would say, you know, over two to use the peppermint hydrosol, otherwise use lavender, German chamomile. Yarrow, if you can, you know, make it on your own or, or you have a, a supplier for that. And then witch hazel, and this is the witch hazel without alcohol. So you actually want to find it um, at an aromatherapy supplier to make sure you're getting it without alcohol. All right, so cool compresses, and these can be so helpful for when there's a, acute inflammation of any kind, say like with a teenage with acne, you know, cool compresses with witch hazel. I've just been working with a, a, a young girl who's starting to get kind of puberty, a kind of acne, and all she's been doing is, well, I made her a cleanser, but she's been wiping it with um, witch hazel and German chamomile, and even that, I saw her the other day, and it's amazing um, how effective it's being. So sometimes just doing something really simple with hydrosols is effective. So, and we always need these emollients because the, the kind of core characteristic of, of atopic dermatitis is dryness. We want to make sure we're using emollients, even during the acute phase, so oils, creams, lotions, and salves. Same with the subacute, there's less redness and swelling, fewer vesicles and smaller papules, a little bit more dryness is happening, so the use of emollients, and even an emollient bath, you could do like a milk bath, whether it's a milk powder or milk or oat um, bath, like I said, just put a bag, a, a muslin bag with oats in the bath and let it... Um, pass through that as the water is collect, being collected in the tub. Um, and then with chronic, when there's a lot of, the chronic is just, just going on as this dull, uh, inflamed condition, we want to use emollients still because we want to protect the skin from losing moisture. We want to help repair the uh, barrier function of the skin and um, reduce inflammation. With psoriasis, a little bit different um, as far as like the, the mechanism which causes uh, psoriasis, but we still want to use anti-inflammatory uh, base materials or essential oils and things that stop the itching, antipuritics. Cool compresses, like I said, and the same thing with um, psoriasis as AD, which is the use of emollients. If you're dealing with a heat rash or hives, these are places where using emollients is not a great idea. They're better um, that if you use gels, and you can use either aloe vera gel or what, what I use is this aloe vera jelly. I'm going to give you a recipe in a moment. So the gel with the heat and the hives, the, the mechanism of action is such that you really want to get something very cooling such as a gel. Um, and, and antihistamine, anti-inflammatory, antipyritic onto the skin um, to help get rid of the reaction that's occurring. 
but I don't recommend the use of emollients. So antipyritics, they um, help relieve skin. They tend to have an antihistamine action. Uh, causes of itchiness, we're specifically looking at itchiness caused by the cycle of eczema. And with essential oils that are uh, have been found to have antihistamine activity, we have German chamomile, Matricaria recutita, lavender, tea tree, and turmeric. With the antipyritics, there's less as far as studies go, um, but Matricaria recutita is probably the most pronounced. I will say here too, there's a great research um, that came out years ago, actually, on German chamomile essential oil, it was used in a gel base and it was found that the skin, basically more water was absorbed into the skin in the gel that had German chamomile in it than gels that either had no essential oil or had other essential oil. So Matricaria uh, recutita is indicated for a number of reasons. It's anti-inflammatory. Um, quality anti, uh, and as well as uh, antipyritic and antihistamine and then it's also helpful in um, having this helping the skin to absorb water placed on it so creating a gel say an aloe vera gel with uh, different hydrosols and then adding German chamomile essential oil along with a couple of other essential oils um, help not only reduce the inflammation, but also aid water absorption. So it kind of plays a, a dual or kind of three roles. Cape chamomile, I put this, there's not research directly with Cape chamomile, but I have personally used it in the treatment of chiggers, which if you have never had them are, are really horrible insect bugs, I'm not, I'm not sure, I think they have like one cell, I don't know, they're really annoying and they cause a lot of inflammation and itching, itch, itch, itch. So I had a Cape chamomile at the time, I didn't have any German chamomile, and I actually used the Cape chamomile undiluted on these like little raised uh, vesicles, I guess, um, and it was, it was the only thing that brought me relief. I was so incredibly thankful to Cape chamomile. So, and then after kind of the very acute inflammation, I just, then I would use it in a gel or a, a salve or whatever I made um, after that. So, hydrosols for antipyritic to help relieve itching, German chamomile, lavender, peppermint, and witch hazel. One thing I will say when we're using hydrosols on the skin, we do want to either spray the skin and then gently pat it, spray the skin and then put a little gel spray the skin and then you know put a cream or a lotion on it. You don't want to spray the skin and then just leave the water on the skin. That can actually um, enhance dehydration. So whenever you put hydrosol onto the skin, you just want to make sure you kind of gently rub it or have like a cotton ball to kind of put it onto the skin, but you just don't want to spray and let it just sit there on the skin. All right. So treatment for most of these inflammatory um, skin or most of the inflammatory skin conditions, you know, keep the skin cool, um, cool compress or cool shower, avoid harsh detergents. I'm just sure like uh, generations of using the really harsh detergents on our soap and there is something called the hygiene uh, hypothesis um, has created a, a kind of a evolved uh, dysfunction in the microbiome of the skin, which is leading to what we see as higher rates of atopic dermatitis occurring, but most often in uh, uh, urban um, versus rural areas. So it's, it's interesting that, you know, there, there could just be, have been a genetic impact over years and years of using harsh cleansers. So now our goal is to kind of try and, you know, help the younger generation recover the healthy microbiome um, and, and moisture of the skin. We're almost oil phobic in our culture. So moisturize, the skin needs oil, the skin needs to be hydrated. It's what our skin wants, moisture. When it has enough moisture, it tends to thrive. Um, 
And then to have allergy testing, you know, if there's, there's a consideration in children, you know, it, it's good to have allergy testing just to try and find out what, what might be triggering it, be it diet like milk or nuts or dairy, bread, um, or the cat, dog, what, whatever might be in the environment. Um, and then also to have massage because the, of the, that stress component, but it can also help to alleviate some of the inflammation. At, uh, so the itchiness, sorry, the itchiness. So we use antipyritics and anti-inflammatory essential oils, and then we use those within gels, lotions. Um, we use uh, hydrosols and or essential oils in cool compresses and then hydrosol sprays. Um, to have an effect. And then I just want to make sure, because I think I'm actually, I'm almost at the end, Kelly. So the dosage under two years, hydrosol and herbal oils, those you can use, you know, to varying degrees as part of your total blend, but essential oils specifically, less than 5%. And then over two years of age with atopic dermatitis, 0.5 to 1% would be fine. Again, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Tweens and teens, um, 1 to 2%. My son loves that he thinks of himself as a tween. Um, all right, and then adults can go anywhere from 2 to 5%. And it's actually a 2% dilution um, is sometimes sometime used, is sometimes indicated in both acute or chronic and the same for five. So it's, it's, it really depends on the expression, what's happening with the individual as to what dosage you would choose. So and here's a sample formulation. I'm going to fill this in tomorrow. I, I, I didn't want to misremember my um, dilutions, but I'm very fond of using a product called aloe vera jelly. And it's made by the same, like that Desert Essence uh, company that makes those aloe vera products. But it's with two L's and a Y. And what I like about it, it's it been emulsified basically to handle both water and oil as additives. So it's really fun to work with on a small scale. You know, you wouldn't be able to go into business selling it. But um, gels are pretty unstable anyway. So it's nice to always make them up fresh and use them within three months. But with aloe vera jelly, so this gel, so you can combine like the calendula infused oil, and it's about, let's say that I use two ounces of jelly, it would be approximately a tablespoon of the infused oil, a tablespoon of the chamomile, and a tablespoon of the lavender hydrosol. And then it, you kind of play around with the texture, like you have to get it just right so that the jelly is not kind of what I call tacky on the skin, like sticky. And then I would use a, a probably a 2% dilution for an adult with this uh, formulation. So it has uh, German chamomile, Matricaria recutita, Rosa damascena absolute. Remember it's a, a ability to help with a keratinocyte differentiation as well as filigree grin production. And Melaleuca quinquinervi, I thought that would might, might help with the immune element of atopic dermatitis. And this is an example of a salve recipe that you could put together. Salve can be really beautiful. And of course, we're, we're entering um, spring, so adding things like uh, uh, plantain and chickweed to this yeah. as a salve can help make the, the base as, as therapeutic as the essential oils we put into it. Okay. And then, so this is my last slide before I say thank you. Um, I do recommend if anyone's like, oh, wow, I kind of want to learn more about inflammation. Like I said, I've become a bit, bit of an anatomy physiology and pathophysiology um, junkie. I just, I just can't get enough understanding of all the different mechanisms going on in our body. But if you do want to just have a refresher of the inflammatory response, um, so maybe also when you're reading some academic papers on essential oil research, you can understand what's happening when they refer to different um, inflammatory mediators and how essential oils are affecting them. So that's that's it. So Kelly, um, 
I know I've probably gone a little bit over, sorry about that. But I do wanted to say the final thing is just if you are interested in advancing your understanding and use of essential oils for the skin, I do have a course on aromatic applications for the skin. And so we're offering $100 off this course. It's part of our Advanced Aromatic Scholars Program. So this it does assume you have uh, some foundation level training. Um, and to get that discount, you just put in the code Amer Aromatic Skin. So thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. Well, thank you, Jay. That was a wonderful presentation. A lot of information, and I definitely think people will want to study further with that. Yeah, so do, do, we, does, do we have questions? Right, I'm going to stop the recording, then we'll...